Okay, let's look at page eight of the Selected Studies book, which is the Furling E minor etude. It is marked Largo Lacrimoso, which is an alternate spelling of Lacrimoso, which means something like sad or unhappy or grieving, right? Um, so it's supposed to be this uh, kind of like tortured, <laughs> like emotional sort of piece, I suppose, which um, is, is the mindset you want to have, like the interpretation that you want to bring to it. This is one of those ones uh, that has a lot of tricky counting spots, a lot of questions about phrasing, a lot of, you know, how do you want to play different ornaments? Like how do you move into and out of particular trills, for example? And the good news is for some reason, uh, this etude is all over YouTube. There are a lot of flute professors demonstrating it. I kind of get the sense that it must be used as an audition exercise Excerpt in lots of different states, not just here in Missouri. So uh, Google like furling E minor flute etude, uh, something like that, and you should see a bunch of videos pop up, um, including just straight demonstrations of how to play this particular piece, right? So um, in that sort of sense, like you just get like an automatic recording to listen to, just put the video on in the background um, or like really study what they're doing, right? Like, and you'll hear a lot of different interpretations of it um, by really trustworthy people. So I'm not gonna reproduce that here, right? Like it's already out there. So like definitely make good use of it. So one of the challenges in this etude is counting, right? Um, and it's a really good example of how the amount of space that a note takes up on the page is not really related to how long it is in actual time, right? Um, so, so appearances can be deceiving on this one. And something that I do, uh, sometimes I will mark in my music, I'll like draw a line through each of the like eighth notes, for example, like every half beat. And then I can see like, oh, this measure, um, uh, takes up this much time here, that much time there. Like I can kind of like see that kind of expansion and compression in the page that way. Um, but then also when I practice with a metronome and I put the metronome on the eighth note, which is definitely my recommendation for this particular etude, um, it, it kind of points things out to me. It lets me like kind of like staple down my beat in places and know like, here are these 32nd notes going into 16th notes. Do I really have that change exactly right? Here are um, 16th note triplets, right? Um, here are um, 16th notes. Here's a, a good old quarter note, right? Like, but how much time does it really take up when it's surrounded by all this other stuff? So for example, um, take a look at the last measure on the end of the second line, right? which in my experience is something that people like tend to worry about a lot. Um, if you put those like eighth note sort of hash marks in there, you can really make it like look like more apparent to you that, oh, these are kind of like 16th notes really. And they're not that fast for a song that is this slow, like relative, like there's a lot of black on the page, but it's not really that fast for your fingers comparatively, right? Um, like you have to work it out, sure, like that's fine, but like it's it's not the most virtuosic thing on the page actually, um, by any stretch of the imagination. But then looking at those uh, eighth note sort of markings as well will point out to you really how much slower the real 16th notes are at the end of that measure, right? So that you really put them exactly where they should go with the beat. This is also something I would do a line or two down. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. The first measure at the fifth line, right? You have 16th notes and then you have a sextuplet. Well, where are your um, eighth notes within that, right? Like where is that beat within it? And that will point out to you what you're really doing is you're going from dividing that eighth note up into uh, two notes to dividing it up into three notes. So it's that kind of like classic difference between um, um, feeling something in two, feeling it in three, how do we subdivide the beat, right? Um, that's all happening in the space of that one measure. And again, it is not that fast uh, by the time you really think about like, what does it mean to play 
um, Largo Lacrimoso, right? Like what, what is the, the real tempo indication that's happening here? All of that said, one of the challenges with that kind of a tempo indication is uh, breathing, right? Always. <laughs> and so first off, have a plan for every single breath you're going to take. Um, there are places on the page where it's marked. Uh, there are other places where I guess, you know, it's like a, a rest or something. They just assume that that's where it is. No, like mark it in, like really know where are you breathing um, and practice using your air, right? like and and practice not giving all your air away at the beginning of the phrase right like a lot of times um people will start off with like that piano um and um it's like where like they're clearly like running out of air like by the end of that, right? Um, so use your air in a way that makes sense at the beginning of it, like save your air, don't give away all of it. Like think about you have the entire space until the next breath to use that air. But not only that, maybe you don't want to use all the air in your lungs, right? Like maybe you want to still have some there so that when you get to that next breath, you're you're topping things off. You're not trying to fill everything up completely from the start. And this will help um, here. It will help in basically anywhere that you have long phrases where you're trying to make your breath last longer. The other thing that's really good about uh, practicing with a metronome and having all of your breaths planned out in advance is that you can plan taking your breaths in time, right? Um, a lot of times we lie to ourselves about how much time it takes to breathe or how much time we're really taking for a particular breath, right? And um, the next note after a breath is coming a little bit late and maybe it's just on the very like end of the beat instead of like the beginning of it, right? Sometimes it's really quite off when you start practicing with a metronome and realizing like, oh, like every time I take a breath, I am late um, with my next note, right? So plan out your breaths, practice taking them in time, Use good technique when you're breathing, right? So that you um, use your stomach muscles, like kind of like push your stomach muscles out to like really um, suck more air into your lungs faster, right? Um, and also try to have like a O sort of a shape to your mouth and throat when you're breathing in so that it's a quieter breath as comparing to like an ah sort of a sound, which I think is what we kind of default to, but that's where you get the sort of a breath, right? That's like this little gasp that is very audible, right? Like the O oh sort of a sound or ooh sort of a sound even like um, shape and sound is, is gonna be less audible. It's gonna be a quieter breath. Um, and that's one of those little refinements that you wanna get into the habit of making. Now with most things, and certainly if you're going for all state, right? Like I, I think you probably know, it, it goes without saying that you want beautiful tone everywhere that you're playing. You want beautiful phrasing. You want really good use of your air and your instrument, right? Um, but it, sometimes I think we still end up kind of underestimating how difficult that really is in certain places, especially when there are things that look like they're really fast on the page or that looks like we're gonna do like a lot of uh, tricky finger technique, right? Like that is like more visible to us in some kinds of ways. Um, but that being said, this particular etude has a lot of virtuosic changes in register, right? Where you're playing high notes and all of a sudden you're playing low notes or vice versa. And you want to think about how does my air need to be focused for those higher notes? How does my air need to be focused for those lower notes? And not just focus, but also air speed, which is connected to support, right? Um, so like, let's say like the first measure on the fourth line, right? You're starting up, you're at a high G, and within the space of a measure, you're down on this low F sharp, right? Um, 
what do you need to do? And it's not something you would describe with words, right? Like it's something that you like physically figure out. What do you need to do to have a beautiful singing tone on that high G natural and then a really rich, round, beautiful tone on that low F sharp? Those are two very different feelings in um, the way that you are using and focusing and supporting your air. So use your ears as your guide, right? Like, and just play a bunch of high G's, play a bunch of low F naturals and find like, okay, how does this need to feel? Like what sounds good? What's the feeling when it's sounding good? Okay, now how do I transfer that into the context of this piece that keeps moving up and down and up and down and up and down, like wherever, right? Um, and, and you will be rewarded with a much more um, sort of consistent tone and sound like throughout this etude, which is gonna make it really beautiful. Two other things that are important for phrasing in this one um, are obviously your dynamics, right? There's a lot written on the page in terms of dynamic contrasts, and you really want to bring those out. Remember that a change that sounds really big to you underneath your ears, right, um, is probably not going to sound as apparent to someone that's even five feet away from you, and certainly you know, like I, I don't know what size of room you're playing this audition in, um, but all of that is going to make a difference. So the more that you exaggerate your dynamic changes, um, and honestly, when you have like mezzo piano or mezzo forte or something like that, which there really isn't a lot of on this page, they're just like piano forte, right? Um, almost like start moving like your mezzos like more to the extremes as well because it's just gonna come across more. Um, especially in a situation where you have an Allstate judge who is sitting there with one of those um, uh, pieces of paper and rubrics and they're like checking off like you did this, you didn't do that, like whatever. Um, they'll have like a spot where they're really listening for, well, is the beginning of the third line, is there really that decrescendo into a piano happening? Do I really hear a difference? Um, and so, you know, the standard advice on, on that is decrescendo doesn't mean get quieter. It means make sure that you're loud and then get quieter, <laughs> which is like, you know, you don't want to take that to an extreme, but it is kind of a good rule for really bringing out a dynamic contrast. So another thing that sometimes happens with this etude is that people get stressed out about the rests, right? Like they, they're uncomfortable with the silence in the room. Uh, they feel like I'm here to play, so therefore I need to just keep playing, 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 playing. Um, and the rests kind of like don't breathe, right? Like um, they'll get to the two quarter rests in the middle of the page there, right? And those two beats, which is really like just two beats, but at this low of a tempo, it's a considerable amount of time, right? Um, because they're in a performance or audition situation, it stretches out like into an eternity and they feel really uncomfortable with the silence of the room and they jump back in, right? Um, really practice feeling comfortable with silence, right? You deserve to have people listening to you. That is a standard part of like the psychology of performance, right? Like you have to believe that you have something worth sharing with your audience, right? And you do, you've been working on this audition material for ages. Um, you deserve to have your moment with the judges, right? Like that's okay. Um, and it's a good thing too, right? Like, but then like when you get to that fermata at the second to the last line in the, the song, right? Um, let it stretch out a little bit, like, give it a moment, like hear it, and then like decide musically when you're going to come in next. Don't let anxiety make that determination for you. Let your musical instincts make that determination for you. And that's really going to show a, a kind of maturity to your musicianship that uh, will definitely make you stick out, right? Like it will definitely um, put you heads and shoulders above um, a lot of people, right? Um, that are going to get to those rest and just kind of like jump ahead of them because, um, it, it is a little bit like self-conscious, like, and, and playing is self-conscious and, and 
um, hearing silence is self-conscious, right? But like, uh, silence is what also like surrounds music, right? Like it's, it's, it's also a part of music in, in a very significant way. Um, and not to get, you know, overly philosophical about it, but like, I, I think we really do need to think about as musicians, we're working with both sound and silence and how do they work together? And, and how does that influence the experience of playing? How does it influence the experience of listening? Um, how do we work with that as musicians, right? Like, and, and so showing that you are able to, um, I don't know, like stand there and like stake your claim to that, that, that time, right? Um, is going to be a really strong uh, aspect of your musicianship in this audition. Now, finally, I think uh, in this etude, uh, we definitely need to talk about all of the little notes, right? Um, all of the grace notes, the trills, the turns, like all of the, the ornaments that are put across the page, right? Uh, sometimes I think that like it's it's interesting like if they were written out rhythmically people would be aware of uh, how quick they really are um, and and maybe would like practice them more but it seems like a lot of times we we take our grace notes for granted we take our um, ornaments for granted and we don't like practice them in their own right and we just kind of like want to force them to be in place um, but like I don't know, like kind of invite them into your playing a little bit more, right? Like, like give it some time to take a look at it and think about how do you really want to do it? Um, this is one of those things where, like I said, there's all these YouTube videos of flute professors demonstrating uh, this particular etude. Watch those, pay attention. Like, how do they place their grace notes? Um, wh what is happening with those? musically as well like so that it really is an ornament and not something that's like clunky and weighing down your playing either right like you just want that like extra bit of like sparkle or shimmer um into the phrases which i think is is sometimes what these ornaments are designed to do right um so for example let's take a look at uh, the turn on the fourth line up from the bottom, right? Um, turns are ornaments that we don't see super often in band class, uh, but they're great ornaments. You know, there's a couple different ways to write them and that does change how you play them. The way that this one is written, it goes just like it looks, right? It's going to go up, it's going to go down, and then it's go back to where it was. So you have D, up to E, back to the D, down to the C sharp, which is why there's that sharp underneath the turn, um, and then back to your D. Um, like that, going from that D to the F natural, the is, is the turn on the inside of that note. Um, so practice it in its own right. It is kind of frankly an annoying set of fingerings right because you've got to like manage your pinky with the um, D natural to the E natural and the C sharp and everything um, the D to an F sharp is always tricky because you are doing these two fingers need to coordinate together and also don't forget you of course have your first finger up for your D natural right um, so it's it is like take your time with it like even though like you understand in the abstract how to do it practice the concrete aspect of what it is to play that series of fingerings in that rhythm and um, it's going to come across really beautifully and really lovely same thing with your trills right like sometimes I think we are way too influenced by the kind of trill that you would want to use in like a Sousa march like stars and stripes forever or something right like um that is one valid form of of style for a trill right no question it is not the only way to play a trill however and um it's not, okay, alternate these two notes as fast as you possibly can for the entire duration of the note, right? Um, not at all. Like it might be much more musical to um, start slow and speed up or start faster and slow your way out of it. Um, you may not really need to trill for the entire duration of the note. Um, it's an ornament, right? Like it's supposed to add something musically and there are a lot of different ways of doing that. So again, listen really carefully to other flutists and the ways that they uh, play their trills, the way that they move into and out of them. Um, and 
for one thing, I think it'll be way more interesting, right? Like it'll kind of open it up. Um, but it will also give you, again, a much more mature musicality to the way that you play this. And again, that just like laying claim to the silence of rests, right? Um, that's going to show... Uh, how you are as a musician. It's going to show your maturity as a musician. It's going to make you rise head and shoulders above um, other people who, you know, haven't really practiced doing that yet. Um, so make sure that you bring those aspects into your audition, and I know that it will serve you well. All right, that's my advice for this one. If you found something useful in this video, please like it, comment below, subscribe to my channel. You can also find my studio over on Instagram. You can learn so much good information from YouTube videos, but at the same time, know that it is the personalized feedback that you will get from your private teacher that makes all the difference to your playing. So find a good teacher near you, and if you're in St. Louis, I'd love to work with you.